Okay, welcome everybody to Tom Ramos's talk. This is part seven of our eight series titled From Berkeley to Berlin. Today's talk is being recorded. If you missed any of the previous talks, the replays are available on the Lisa website on the author series page. For those of you who are joining us on WebEx, please enter your questions to Tom on the Q&A and I will read those questions on your behalf. For those of you here in person, just wait until we give you the microphone to ask the questions so that those that are virtual can hear your questions as well. Um, Lisa will be holding a drawing for a chance to win one of Tom's books, and then winners will be notified after the talk. Please help me welcome in introducing thank Tom. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Right, good afternoon. And uh, all right, so let's dive right into that. I'll leave more time for questions at the end. And all right, so last week we spoke about, I called it the, um, the upstarts. It's about the upstarts, and they've arrived. And we heard how um, Edward Teller, Ernest Lawrence, he came down with severe attacks of colitis. They were hospitalized, and the weapons program fell on the shoulders of two very young physicists, Harold Brown, 28 years old, and Johnny Foster, 32 years old. And they ran the two groups, which run the two halves of a thermonuclear warhead. Uh, you had the um, Johnny Foster running the atomic bomb part of the part of that, in which, if you've forgotten, and if to, for a thermonuclear weapon or a hydrogen bomb, it starts with an atomic bomb goes off, and that acts as a trigger to generate enough energy, which goes then into what's called a secondary, the atom bomb being called the primary. But then that energy goes into the secondary, implodes it, and then it explodes. And that's where you get your full thermonuclear yield. And Harold Brown ran the megaton group, which was dealing with the secondaries. And Johnny had the, the uh, hectaton group, which was designing the primaries. And they, on their first shot out, their first time, these two very, very young, inexperienced physicists went out. They both had successful tests, Johnny with the Clio and um, Harold with the Linda device. All right, and now uh, that was in 1955. Those tests took place in Nevada at the Nevada test site. In those days, operations ran every other year you would test in the Pacific, and in the alternate years you were back in Nevada. So now we're up to 1956. The next operation of tests is called Operation Red Wing, and it's going to take place in the South Pacific. And here we can see now, uh, here we have the young these very adventuresome, really tough veterans now uh, in there. And of course, in my youth, and when I was in my 20s, I was in a thing called the United States Army. And, um, and I didn't have to go through the tough, rigorous training that these people had to do. And you can see how tough life was uh, for them in their laboratories in the South Pacific, uh, putting up with what was being offered. Um, but I might mention that they are obviously out in the sun a lot. In fact, 30 years later, uh, we had an outbreak here. It seemed like a greater than average occurrence of melanoma was occurring within the laboratory population. And of course, immediately, people would jump up and say, it's the radiation at the lab, it's radiation at the lab. And I go, duh. Back in the 1950s, many, radi many of the laboratory employees were out there in the South Pacific. And in fact, here you think, I think what the, the guy in the back there on the left I call him Mr. Melanoma. He looks like the color of the Jeep. Uh, it's just, you know, these guys were sucking down the rays. And so I, I suspect much of that that occurred was from how much time was spent uh, working out on the atolls, any we talk in bikini in the South Pacific. But I digress. So let's get, get to this. So now you got the next years coming up. And both group leaders, both Johnny Foster and Harold Brown, what they're going to do is leverage the success they got from Operation Teapot in 1955 with the Clio and the Linda. And uh, so the Megaton group, uh, first they adopted a protocol. Up to this point, all devices, Ruth, Ray, uh, and then we had uh, uh, the Clio and the Linda, they, they, uh, they adopted a principle of naming their devices after the uh, female first names. There must have been something in the air because I guess the hurricanes were also named after female first names. But after that, they switched. And now the Megaton group would now name its devices. They would, they would give nicknames 
after musical instruments, and the Hectoton group followed too. And they would, they would now name their devices, give them nicknames that were named after species of birds. And so if you're around here and you hear something called a musical instrument, you know that's a secondary. And if you hear a bird name, then that's a primary. And it became, that became standard for the next 30 years, keeping to that kind of um, protocol. So, the, uh, so Brown, is what he's going to do is he's going to take the Linda and exploit it and make it bigger and make it smaller and push it out even further, that revolutionary design. And in uh, Johnny Foster's case, though, the Clio was great. It was extremely radical, but it really did have, not have much future as a kind of a weapon going into to be useful. It, <clears throat> excuse me. It was successful. It worked the way they did, but it was heavy, used an excessive amount of nuclear fuel. And so they, they were going to come up with a new idea, and they adopted some ideas they got from uh, two physicists, Doc Beale and Ernie Martinelli, who had proposed a thing called the geode back in 1953. And so Johnny's going to pick up on that idea and then come up with a brand new device. OK, so now back to the megaton group, though. So we had the big, medium, and small. The big one is um, uh, Johnny uh, von Neumann, a great mathematician, the 20th century mathematician, uh, was at a meeting with the megaton group and was, got up and started explaining of a novel way to implode a secondary, to, to really get a good implosion of a secondary. And one of the physicists sitting there was Mike May. Heard him? Mike, uh, being as sharp as he is, took the idea and ingested it and started thinking about how we could take von Neumann's ideas and translate that into a design. And he did. He started working on it. He uh, came up with a, a re really revolutionary concept called a bassoon. Now, I feel like I'm using the word revolutionary radical too much, but this truly was, again, a very, very different type of design. And he was uh, leveraging, frankly, a lot of the good ideas that he'd gotten from von Neumann. Now, at the same time, uh, in Operation Castle in 1954, two years earlier, uh, if you remember, the first shot was Bravo. Castle Bravo was 15 megatons. It was gross, grossly overyield, And it had uh, dropped fallout on to the Marshall, Marshall Islands, including some of the populated Marshall Islands, which caused 250 people getting uh, beta burns and other types of injuries from, from the radioactive fallout. And so the Eisenhower administration put out an urgent call for the laboratories to design clean, or what they called cleaner weapons. What they meant was, frankly, weapons that simply really greatly reduced the radioactive fallout that came, that came from them. And uh, Herb York picked up on, on Mike's idea, and that became then an urgent design to try to come up with a clean weapon. And again, what he called it, the, it's the bassoon. It's a musical instrument, and it's a large device. And um, I wish I could share with you what Mike did, but what he had to do in order to make it cleaner is a greater, greater reliance on fusion reactions. Because most of the radioactive fallout comes from fission. It comes from fission fragments that, that, are, come, that are the uh, result of the, of the nucleus breaking apart into two fission fragments. And these fission fragments are very radioactive. And that's, that's where much of the radioactivity from a, from a fission bomb comes out. But with fusion, uh, you, don't get, you don't get that type of uh, uh, residue radioactivity coming out. So it's much cleaner. And so in Mike's device, what he did was he, he came up with designs that enabled the temperature within the device to, to remain much higher for a much longer period of time in, in order to get an appreciable amount of fusion going out. So you got a much more appreciable amount of fusion energy rather than fission energy in your weapon. And as a result, made it cleaner, would make it cleaner. And so that, that became the bassoon. And um, Mike developed, he, they tested it. It worked precisely the way he said it worked, would work. Uh, it was four times cleaner than any typical weapon that we, they saw in Operation Castle from two years earlier. So it was immediately got the attention. Mike further developed that in the coming years, and eventually that would become uh, the B-41. And remember uh, that um, they earlier, based on work going on with the Rand Corporation analyst working at Livermore, the idea that these things need to be smaller. Warheads should be smaller. And Mike's uh, was very much smaller, too. 
So when Mike's uh, device came in, um, uh, the classic hydrogen bomb of the day was the B-17. There's a picture of it there. Those are two laboratory engineers uh, standing, had their picture taken with it. That's a B-36 bomber behind them. You can see it's a monstrous thing. It's about 46,000 pounds. It's so big, you needed a big bomber like that just to carry it. And Mike eventually would come up with his idea for the bassoon, would evolve into another thing and into another thing, but eventually become the B-41. And it was one-fourth the size of that device and gave the same performance. Gave, gave, in fact, even better performance in many ways. And it was so small that you didn't need a big, huge bomber to carry it. It could even be carried by a fighter bomber. So it was a huge improvement, which also meant for more survivability. And this all being done on his very first attempt at a, at a design for a nuclear weapon. So it's quite an accomplishment for a very young man, uh, just fresh out of graduate school at Berkeley, and that's his first project. The uh, other two tests that the Megaton group are going to do in Operation Red Wing uh, is the uh, medium and small, right? M uh, Mike's bassoon is the large one. Now we got the medium one. That's basically taking something that's really relatively close to what the Linda looked like in size and that. They're, but you had to modify it, and they wanted to weaponize it. They wanted to make it into something that we could be weaponizable. The Linda was not very weaponizable. It worked fine, but it, had to have, had a, it needed modifications in that to make it. And they did that, and that became uh, what, what I'm calling the medium size. And I can't give it the nickname because it actually did become a weapon. So to keep this, keep this lecture very clean, I'm not going to give you its nickname. But it was developed, and uh, this is the, the, the uh, appropriate arrival of Sandia. Livermore, the Sandia Livermore group came in, and then they started working with, at, with the laboratory personnel and developed this new device, and it became the W27 warhead. It was the very first warhead of the laboratory to then go into the nuclear stockpile. And it became, among other things, it became the warhead for the Regulus missile, which the Navy used. The Navy was trying to uh, garner up a nuclear force to match what the Air Force was doing with the Strategic Air Command. The Navy was also trying to come up with some way to project nuclear force out. And one way would be a cruise missile, this Regulus missile. See it? When I was a boy, we used to have Rev Revell model kits. I remember getting a kit of the Nautil USS Nautilus. That was a submarine that went underneath the North Pole. The first one to go on, you know, went from uh, the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean or the vice versa, completely under the North Pole. And when you got a model of it, it had this big cylindrical tank in the back of it with this little missile thing next to it. Well, that little thing on the Nautilus, that, that is a Regulus missile. And the Nautilus was one of those vessels that first got outfitted with this thing, and it carried a Livermore warhead on the back of it. So it was the first success for the laboratory to, see, uh, to actually make it into the nuclear stockpile. At least the third, now the third weapon is you had the large, the medium, and now the small. The small smaller version, version of the Linda, they called the flute. And the flute was indeed small. Now, uh, this thing was so small that uh, they really had to be careful, because as you get smaller, radiation channels get smaller. And they were even worried with the radiation channel collapse. So these things were getting so small, they were worried about all sorts of things they didn't have to worry about with larger weapons. And so the, the uh, calculations going on they were very intricate, very careful, a lot of code work, a lot of computer code work going in to really help them understand the radius of transport going on. Now, uh, up to this point, like with the bassoon and also with the Regulus missile, uh, the, uh, the Livermore secondary used a Los Alamos primary to drive them, to trigger, to trigger the devices, because it was only Los Alamos that had proven primaries that existed along the way. But the flute was so small that Brown really was adamant to keep it as small as he could. And so they went with an experimental primary from the Hector 10 group, from the other group at the lab. Um, talk about competition. These, these two groups would even go tete-a-tete -tete on this. Uh, in fact, to give you an idea, when I was a member once when I was interviewing Johnny, for his, uh, Johnny Foster for his biography, uh, I m made the horrible mistake of saying, well, well Johnny, when you were, when you were developing this primary, and he immediately corrected me. He said, I'm not a primary for anybody. We, we develop atomic bombs of their own worth, they're this and that. 
And it was very clear I was stepping on really thin ice, and never again would I say the word primary in front of him, but um, no, Johnny, your, your atomic device you developed that was later used for this, and that was much more acceptable. But nevertheless, for the flute, the primary was indeed a experimental device that came out of Johnny Foster's hectaton group. Untested, going, but these guys, uh, this, was, this was small. This thing, the flute, would weigh less than 1,000 pounds. Uh, one of the smaller thermonuclear weapons, I showed you the 17, the B-17 was, what, 46,000 pounds. This thing is, what, 3% the size of that thing. Uh, some, of the smallest, some of the smaller thermonuclear weapons at the time weighed one and a half tons. These things were really small. And now, you, now they're, they're putting the flute up, which is less than half a ton. And uh, so, we risk, but they put it up, tested it, and it worked. I mean, not only did it work, it worked precisely. It, it was in a few percentage points of what they had calculated the yield was going to be, and that's what came out. And just as much as the Linda was kind of uh, uh, that revolutionary device that it took a couple of years for, to absorb in that this new concept that was being pushed out of Livermore was, was catching on, so too, when the flute goes off, it's going to take a little while to absorb what the nuances, but as I'm going to show you in this lecture later on, it has a big impact that the laboratory is able to develop a thermonuclear warhead that small. Um, okay. Now, that's the megaton group. Now, switching back over to the hectaton group. Johnny, uh, again, now these, these devices are named after birds, and uh, just as much as the megaton group is going to have three devices, small, medium, and large, the hectaton group is going to do the same thing. They're going to have a small, medium, large, but, or large, medium, small, because uh, now these are bird names, and it'll be called the, the swan, the swallow, and the swift, large, medium, small. And now, um, trying to be careful again, I, I think I keep my monitor of my brain going here. Um, I'm getting tired of saying the word revolutionary, radical, but these things, these new devices coming out of the hectaton group were radical and revolutionary. They, they did not look like the Clio. As much as the Clio pushed forward, it was very different. It worked, and, and as I expressed last week, you know, Lawrence was hopping up and down the hallway yelling, we've done it, we've done it. Uh, these things didn't look anything like that. Uh, they didn't look like anything else anywhere, for that matter. And Johnny wrote, uh, in order to explain it, there was that revolutionary that Johnny ended up writing two papers, uh, which went to the Atomic Energy Commission, just to explain the concept, because he knew when these things came out, they were going to look at them, what the hell is this kind of thing. And so Johnny wrote and gave, basically gave the theory behind them, two uh, very elegant papers, which I've read several times. I just wanted to make sure I understood perfectly where he was going with this. And I remember the first time I was reading this, I mean, I'd started reading give you an idea, when I was doing the background, my own background research, trying to understand how this stuff was evolving, I went all the way back into the Manhattan Project, and I remember reading the Daily Journal of Hans Bethe, the theoretical division leader at, at Los Alamos, and watching how they overcame one episode, one challenge after a challenge after a challenge, and how they come out, and how clever they were in making the project move forward like that. And I was kind of in that mode, following this is the way you do things, this is the way, this is the way you make things work. And then I'm reading Johnny's paper, and I'm going, what the hell is he thinking? I mean, this, is, this is different. This is not following those kind of basic rules that I was getting used to at the time. But that's what I mean by radical. And so he's coming up with these. He, prints, he puts out these two papers, announces, this is what we're going to try to do. And uh, the swan will be the workhorse. That's the bigger one. Uh, it's tested over 100 times out of site 300. Remember, after the success of the Clio and the um, the Linda the year before, the Atomic Energy Commission allows them to start up Site 300, which is uh, about 12 miles east of Livermore. And uh, there they put a high explosives test facility where you can go out and finally test your devices uh, under uh, high explosive testing. And the Swan was put under 100 hydro tests out there. Uh, they just really, really were getting it down and going through learning all the mistakes. They had to develop the diagnostics to learn how well Everything was imploding, and this, that, and the other thing. A lot of work, a lot of work going on at Site 300, and a lot of that was devoted to the Swan. Eventually, uh, it would be taken out, and it worked. 
it, it did work, um, which was a phenomenal achievement. I mean, it, this uh, revolutionary new kind of concept designed to go after it, it worked the way they said it would. The other one, the swallow, a smaller version of the swan. It's small enough, it could have been an eight inch uh, shell. You know, it, it could fit inside an eight inch gun that the army had. Uh, not that it would be one, but, but it was that small. And they had problems getting that thing to work. It was smaller. And when you make things smaller, frankly, getting everything, getting all the parts to, to cooperate with each other and to get everything to work simultaneously is more of a challenge. And they were having challenges. Uh, six months before they're going to test the Swallow, Johnny even pre prepared a work in progress report that went up to headquarters Atomic Energy Commission saying, well, we just conducted a hydro test and the Swallow doesn't work. And this is six months before the nuclear test. And, uh, but then he can come, I think we know what's going wrong. And I, I believe we will have a solution to this. And it's a testimony to Johnny, one, he, he didn't pull any punches. He told his boss and he told the Atomic Energy Commission precisely what was going on. It didn't work at that moment, but we think we can fix it. And then Herb York, who got the report, did not change it a bit, sent it right up to Atomic Energy Commission headquarters. There was a General Starbird, who was the uh, DASMA, he was the deputy for military applications up at AEC. He accepted it and he trusted Johnny's judgment and nothing was done, they just let him go on. And six months later, they did take it. It was the fourth version of the Swallow. Swallow went through Swallow 1, Swallow 2, Swallow 3. Swallow 4 was the one they tested and it worked exactly, again, exactly the way they said it would. It was, it was a, quite an achievement. When you see the pucker factor that was going on just a few months before that, that they could make that thing work. And finally, the Swift was even smaller than the Swallow. And if the Swallow team was having problems getting the Swallow to work, the Swift team had that in spades. They're the same kind of problems with an even smaller device. The Swift team was headed up by an Air Force captain, uh, Jasper Welch, his name was, who later would become Major General Welch, the head of the Air Force's research and development. Uh, but here is a, an Air Force captain, he's leading his team, and they are having big problems trying to get this thing to behave in a way that would work. <clears throat> he finally got it, got it in, made some compromises. You can imagine the last three months before they packaged this thing and sent it off to the South Pacific, well, a lot of late nights, early morning work. But they took it out and it worked. It did not work as planned. I think there was something like a 20 or 30% degradation in the yield, less than what they thought. But it still worked. It wasn't a disaster. It did work, just not as well as they thought. And in fact, they learned some things out of when they diagnosed what had gone wrong with the SWIFT. It introduced to us a problem that even existed decades later with the way Mother Nature behaves in the certain types of environments. The SWIFT was our kind of, to me, it was our first indication of a particular problem that would come up and not go away for several decades while we were trying to figure it out. But anyway, three devices, they all worked. It was another, basically, came up. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I got ahead. This is where I'm going at. Now at the end, here, here we're seeing more, here's more fun and frolics or hardworking people in the South Pacific. There's Mr. Melanoma, the second guy from the left. Uh, a physicist would have said he's had uh, an overdose of ultraviolet radiation, but kinder people might say he's got a nice tan. You could take it the way you want to take it. Uh, I also uh, had a nice picture of Myron Knapp. I mentioned him last week. He was the engineer who, on his own initiative, ran out and got 10 pounds of spare ribs, wrapped it around the Clio to test if it could, the Clio would go critical if you, if you put tissue near it. Uh, very imaginative to people. Myron, of course, was also the father of Brett Knapp. Brett Knapp was our, was our laboratory director for a short while, uh, several years ago, maybe 10 years ago now. Uh, great guys, good thinkers, kept moving, kept things moving, okay? So uh, I went through this already, except now at the end of it here, when they finished, Johnny had a goal at the end of each session, each operation, when they, when they come up with a new device and test it, Immediately his mind went, what are we going to do next year? What changes? How do we move forward? And what's kind of amazing to me at the, at the rate at which these people were moving is just a, a month or two or three, I'm sorry, two or three months after the testing of the SWAN, Johnny writes a document out, sends it up to the Atomic Energy Commission. 
says we're now working on a new device which will even more efficiently use the materials we have to make a much more efficient and usable atomic device. And we're calling the program Robin. So he announces at that point, we're going to create a new device. We're calling it Robin. Uh, the way it came about, uh, Johnny, um, Johnny uh, brought his whole division out to any we talk. He didn't just bring a couple of people that had their names attached to something. He brought the whole group out. They were all in this together. And in between, pause, in between shots, they would gather into a Quonset hut, um, open the doors at both ends, get a breeze going through. They were all sitting there in their shorts. And then he had a blackboard up there. And then uh, Jim Wilson or, or someone else would get up and draw an idea on the blackboard for a new type of device. And then they all jumped in. There were no computers. Nothing like that. They remember they'd just gone through a hundred hydro tests of the swan. They could they could tell you what a shock wave would do to a metal from the back of their hand. They didn't need a computer code to tell them how these metals and other objects behaved under shock under shock waves. And on the blackboard, they actually came up with the concept, which eventually would evolve into the robin. The robin. I'm, I'm going to get a little ahead of myself. The robin will become the grandmother of all atomic devices in the American nuclear stockpile. The Robin would be the epitome. If you take any diagram looking at modern, uh, modern stockpile, it's, you, could see, you could see the marks that the Robin had put into that. It was a great achievement. And it was born inside of Quonset in any we talk with these guys just sitting around working on a blackboard without any computers or anything. All right. Meanwhile, uh, I talked a lot about the designers, because that's, that's the kind of job I was, worked, I was associated with, so I'm kind of familiar with that. But you need diagnostics. If you don't have a good diagnostic program, you do not have a nuclear weapons program. You can't, you can't run a program unless you understand the experiments, how to interpret what's going on. So the diagnostic uh, engineers and the diagnostic physicists are essential for a, for a good program, and Livermore had them. And I, now, earlier, when we talked about Castle Bravo and then the Kuhn event, I mentioned that the head of the diagnostic group at the time was a physicist by the name of Sterling Colgate. And he, he did run, he continued to run the diagnostics group, and then eventually he retired and go on to bigger and better things. Uh, but he, he did go on, and later on, about two years after the Red Wing exercises, Harold Brown asked him to, uh, could he meet with the, they were having these uh, test ban meetings, committees going over, and President Eisenhower was concerned about our ability to spy a secret test, or if someone was cheating, could you tell if they were cheating, especially if they took a test and tried to conduct a test in outer space? Would you be able to see it or detect it? And Colgate said, yeah, we have the diagnostics to do that. But, but he gave a lecture. In order to do that, he had to also show that he could, he could tell the difference between a nuclear blast and a natural phenomenon like a supernova. I mean, both, both of those events would give a bright, a sudden bright flash of light. And frankly, when these things are in outer space, they would look very similar. And so could you tell the difference between the two? And in order to prove that he could, he, he actually got together with a mathematician, Dick White. For those of you here in Livermore, Dick lives right off East Avenue, down by where East Avenue meets Livermore Avenue. And uh, so Dick White and um, Sterling Colgate get together, and they start writing computer code to calculate what would a supernova look like so that a diagnostic, uh, a diagnostic tool could actually see it. In the course of doing that, and doing the physics, they came to a startling discovery or realization that the thing that would happen that would cause a supernova to go would be neutrinos. It would be the, um, if you will, I don't want to get too much into the physics. I mean, it's extremely exciting, but I know some of you are probably going to fall asleep if I go into this. But if you had, like our own sun, if you suddenly could magically compress the sun, the sun is composed of a lot of protons and, and electrons. If you can compress that, some of those electrons would compress with the protons and form neutrons. And when they did that, when they formed and they formed what they call a neutron star, when they did make that combination, they would release a neutrino. This is a chargeless particle that goes out. 
normally neutrinos, you can say that they, neutrinos go through your, or thousands of them go through your body every second. I mean, these things just go through everything. They're, they don't interact very well. But in a neutron star, the density of the material is so great that even neutrons, uh, neutrinos, would start interacting with the matter. And what they discovered in a code work was that there's enough neutrinos created when you collapse the star that it's the neutrinos escaping from the star that blow off the whole surface of the star, and that becomes a supernova. And they presented their findings. Um, I have a copy of the paper they wrote. And it was, it was revolutionary. It, was, it made big news. It was, was kind of cool. And, but it came out of the nuclear weapons program, that discovery, and trying to explain what, again, the diagnostics needed for that. Another gentleman uh, who made some great inroads early on, I introduced him, was it last week? Uh, Bill, um, that's Bill Grassberger. You remember he arrived at the laboratory from the Matterhorn Project, working with uh, John Wheeler in Princeton. And Bill had an idea to, to, ch to check our computer codes. What was extraordinarily important for a thermonuclear weapon is you had to understand radiative transport. Remember, Mike May ran a group, the Radiative Transport Group, and they were writing these codes that did radiative transport. And that was the big secret, or the, not secret so much, but that was the big challenge to trying to understand the physics. And knowing how that radiation traveled down the radiation channel and encompassed the secondary was crucial. And Bill had an idea of testing the codes, and that was, he put a little plug, we'll have to make a little plug in the, in the case along the weapon, and you fill up the plug with a material which had a melting point. On, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a very loose description because there, I know there are some people out there going, no, Tom, it ain't that. The, trust me, okay? But I'm going to put a material in there, and it's going to disintegrate sooner than the material in the case. I'll use my word, melting point, lower melting point. But anyway, when a shock wave hits it, it melts this, this little plug, and what happens is you would, you would see this, this dot of light suddenly where the plug was. Suddenly you would have this light coming out. And if you knew the moment that light came out, you would know the moment that the shock wave had traveled that far. And it gives you a measure of how quickly the, the shock wave is traveling. Because, and then in the bassoon, for example, uh, Bill called these things hot spots, these little spots where the light would pop out. Uh, Bill had three hot spots in the bassoon along, along the length of the device, and he measured them. And he actually came up with the diagnostics to measure. Now, this is astounding to me. Bill's probably 30 years old at the time, and he's developing machines or developing diagnostic tools that can, one, he, he needs to know exactly how this is going to perform under certain these environments. Two, that they would perform the way he designed them. Three, that he can actually see the signal he's looking for. And for background noise, he has a thing called an atomic bomb went off. So his background noise is an atomic bomb, and he's looking for this little beam of light. And to design an experiment in which that works is beyond my imagination. And this 30-year-old did it, and it worked perfectly well. And we were able then, what you do with the results of that is you now go back to your computer codes. I said, well, the computer code said it would take this long. What we measured was that long. So why, why was it wrong? You know? And you begin to realize your, some of the physics you're putting into the radiator transport is a little bit off, and you need to find out why not. And you need this to tell you if you're on or you're off. And that's what makes you better, makes you help, helps you to understand the physics much better. And so uh, another way of diagnosing the output of a weapon is called radiochemistry. This is the chemistry associated with radioactive elements discovered by Marie Curie. All right, and it is amazing how much information you can get by examining the, uh, the, what we call radioisotopes after an explosion. And these radiochemists will go in, they'll take out samples from around where the detonation went off, pull it out, and then draw extremely interesting and accurate conclusions about the yield of the weapon, how well the weapon performed, and this, that, and the other thing. Now, uh, one of the leaders at the lab was a man named Gary Higgins. He was at the Rad Lab, so he was actually working at the Rad Lab before Livermore was created. And in his work there, he actually did work on some nuclear tests in which they would bring a filter that the, after the explosion, 
uh, the Air Force would send a bomber or a plane through the mushroom cloud. I don't know who you get to volunteer to do that, but you do. You get a volunteer. They go through the mushroom cloud, and they have filters in, with the airplane, and the filters pick up debris in the cloud, and then they fly them back to a laboratory, and then you remove the filters, and you put them in the lab, and then they disintegrate the lab, and they do a chemical analysis of the filters, and from that they determine the elements that are in there, including radioisotopes. And in one of these experiments, Higgins even was part of a team, they discovered two brand new elements that had never been seen before, and they later would give the names Einsteininium and Fermium in honor of Albert Einstein and Enrico Fermi, uh, elements, I think they're 99100 in the periodic table, okay? And uh, so this form of, so uh, Street, Ken Street was the head of chemistry, and he asked Higgins to form a heavy elements group that would specialize in analyzing the debris from a nuclear explosion. In the beginning, the heavy elements group had one member, Gary Higgins, uh, but then it grew. And by the time of Operation Red Wing in 1956, uh, he had eight members of his group, and these were highly dedicated people. They were very energetic, pushing. And so what would happen is you'd have, a, you'd have your test, uh, you'd have the explosion, a plane would fly through it, and picking up, picking up uh, the debris from the mushroom cloud. Now, much of that debris was highly radioactive. What that means is it decays very rapidly. Highly radioactive, rapid decay. So if you just take that filter and you ship it back to, the, ship it back to Livermore, most of the stuff's gone. It's long since decayed, and it's, you, you know, it's useless. It's simply useless. You have to get it, you have to examine it relatively quickly after the event to still see these elements before they decay away because they're highly radioactive. So uh, the team would have to move out and the team then would occupy Johnson Island, which would be near, near the Marshall Islands. And so the planes would go in and they'd land at Johnson Island and get, and get these samples immediately put into machines which they can then look at. And uh, Arnie Kirkwood was a technician. Uh, he was not a radiochemist, but he was a technician hired uh, by Kent Street in the chemistry division, and he was sent to the heavy elements group during uh, Operation Red Wing. And one day I was talking with Ani, and he, and he told me this anecdote of his adventures of being with the radiochemistry team, and I just thought it was an interesting story. Uh, so he's on Johnston Allen, and he's there, and it's a week before the test, and a radiochemist comes up to him, and because this he's brand new, he's, I think he's had two or three weeks at the laboratory. Um, and the, and the radio chemist comes up, he says, well, did you ship in the machine, bop, bop, bop. And Arnie goes, no, that's not my job. My job is to do this, I don't ship machines. And he goes, oh dear, so they don't, <laughs> they don't have the machine, they're in Johnston Island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and they don't have the diagnostic machine that they need to analyze this thing. And meanwhile, the test is gonna go off, they're not gonna wait for them. And so there's a bit of a pucker factor builds up uh, Kirkwood, though, before they went out to Johnson Island, he actually did witness how they put the detector together. He actually saw how they did it, and he thought, well, hell, I think I can put that together myself. So he goes over to the EG&G shed. They had a uh, disposal, you know, with lots of scrap metal, scrap yard. And so he goes down there, and he starts picking out wire things, this, that, and the other thing, and he starts to piece it together, and he, he, he creates his own transformer, he counts how many windings he has to get the proper uh, resonances, get the proper oscillations. And then he tries it out, and it worked. He actually got it to work where it worked. Now, that's looking cool, except that now it's also designed to uh, where it's extremely sensitive to radiation because it works in the infrared region. And so the laboratory in which it's being used needs to be at a very low temperature. And there's no refrigeration on Johnson Island at the time it, it burned out. And so he's sitting in a Quonset hut, you know, it's 110 degrees inside the Quonset hut, and he needs to get it to a very low temperature. And not, not the guy, kind of got to give up. He remembered seeing a liquid nitrogen tank by the scrapyard. So he procures a Jeep, picks up two Dewar flasks, drives over there, fills up the Dewar flask with liquid nitrogen, comes back, and he pours the liquid nitrogen on the floor of the Quonset hut, closes the door, and sure enough, brrr, the temperature comes down. And just as it gets to the right temperature, the filter arrives, the airplane comes in, lands, they take the filter, they get it in there, they conduct a test, and it worked perfectly. The machine worked, they, they had really, uh, it all worked successfully. 
they're all slapping each other on the back, you know, how good they are, you know, how great we are. And they're having a little party on the beach. And then Kirkwood decides to just celebrate himself because, you know, he realized what he had just done. So he goes back to the Kwanzaa Hut and he's looking at the machine and how great things was. And he decides he's going to light up a cigarette and celebrate with a cigarette. So he, he uh, lights up his lighter and it won't, it won't light. In fact, it won't even give a spark. He said, well, that's weird. And then it hits him and he drops everything and leaps out the door into the, into the sand. Of course, he's thinking, he realizes that that liquid nitrogen had turned into nitrogen gas. And so the entire cabin now was filled with nitrogen, not oxygen. If he would have stayed there for another 10 or 15 seconds, he would have fainted and died with the lack of oxygen. So, so he would have been our first casualty at a nuclear test, but he, but he did it. But that was kind of the adventures these guys going through, and they were very important to our program. Now, back at the ranch, back at Livermore, I know I've talked about this once or twice, but we had the RAND analyst, the, the uh, military analyst working at the lab, and now they're really coming to the fore with their ideas. And remember now, the national policy at the time is President Eisenhower's massive retaliation in which uh, aggression, really aggressive actions taken by the Soviet Union would be met by the full force of the United States nuclear arsenal back onto the Soviet Union. And that would be our deterrence. That was our way to keep the Soviet Union from being aggressive, overly aggressive. And uh, analysts like Bill Kaufman, this picture up there, he wrote, this is an untenable uh, strategy because the, the penalty has to fit the crime. And, and Kaufman wrote that, he says, the only, in our history, the only time America goes to war, willing to start war, a world war, would be something on the order of a Pearl Harbor attack. But what if you have a regional attack? You know, in today's parlance, what if he goes after Kiev, Ukraine, or something? You know, are you going to start World War III because of a regional, some regional aggression? Probably not, which would mean that would just encourage Stalin or Khrushchev, who, who came out after Stalin, to do that, because he knows the United States is not going to do it. They only have one policy. It's, it's all or nothing. And so it would encourage them to go on these regional aggressive actions, knowing the United States is unable to respond in any other way than a massive retaliation. And uh, so Kaufman argued you needed a much more in intricate strategy. You need to build up your conventional forces. You can't get away on the cheap. You're going to have to build up some sort, form of conventional forces to act as a deterrent. But then with the nuclear strategy, I came up with something they called counterforce. And uh, the key to counterforce is Bernard Brody. He wrote an article at this time, uh, Must We Shoot From the Hip, was a Rand Corporation article. And the idea was that with massive retaliation, you had the whole defense of the United States was based on this massive retaliation. The Soviets know that your, you, that's your um, strategy. And if you remember that picture back then with the, the big bombs, our whole, practically our whole nuclear stockpile was mounted on these huge bombers, which were in SAC bases, Strategic Air Command air bases. And we knew where the air bases were. They were in America, somewhere in the United Kingdom. So we know where they are. And so what would, be, what would prevent the Soviet Union, if they know they're going to proceed on this aggressive act, to first just drop an atom bomb on each of the SAC bases, and then in one fell swoop, they get rid of the one nuclear threat that they're facing and they can do whatever they want. And then Rand, uh, Andy Marshall, I have a picture of Andy Marshall there, Rand Corporation, then they, they start doing war games. I said, well, is that a feasible thing? And so they did a war game in which the Soviets would launch a secret attack against the Strategic Air Command of the United States. And they did a very extensive series of tests and they concluded, yeah, they could do it. It is possible you could really outwit American defenses and actually destroy the strategic arsenal of the United States without fearing any retribution. And, um, and so Brody's writing that we're, we've put ourselves in a position of a house on sand that now we can't afford to lose this stuff. And so we're on a hair trigger, we're on a hair trigger type of environment where if we think we're going to be attacked, we better launch our weapons before the Soviets destroy it. So the secret to a stable 
nuclear deterrent is that it had to be highly survivable. It had to be in a position that even if the Soviets did this intricate surprise attack, launched a surprise attack, enough of our nuclear deterrent would survive that and then be able to retaliate. And in that way, you could convince the aggressor that there's nothing to be gained by attacking us and attacking our nuclear stockpile because it's going to, there'll be enough, plenty enough to then destroy you. And then that would be the stability part of your, of your stockpile. And um, oh, people like General LeMay, Curtis LeMay was the commander of SAC. So I, I got a way out of that. We'll just build a thousand more bombers and we'll build a thousand more bombs. So you can't get them all. And Eisenhower just, no, we're not going to go that way. We're not, we're not going to stop building thousands and thousands and thousands of more things to try to outstrip each other. That, that just is not reasonable. We need a better strategy. And the strategy that they were coming up with was counterforce, in which instead of massive retaliation, what if first you went after some military targets within the Soviet Union, the idea, these were key military targets, but the idea being, all right, we know what you're up to, we're not gonna let you to do it, and if you continue, then we may come in with our full force. So you have kind of a, a pressure gauge, or a, a kind of a pressure gauge that goes off first, to warn the aggressor, no, we're not going to allow you to do this. We're going to go in. So you, you need these stopgap measures to go in. And this is called counterforce. It did require weapons to be highly survivable, which meant they need to be small, and they need to be accurate enough to hit now. You're not going after huge urban complexes. You're not going after very specific military targets. So there was another iteration of this. Now these things have to be highly accurate. So this was what was formulating within the national dialogue, within think tanks like Rand Corporation at the time. All right, now in the height of all of this, a gentleman from the Navy, Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Ollie Burke, he's a hero of World War II, smart, hardworking individual, and as the head of the Navy, he, he proposes an, an idea, how to avoid a Soviet surprise attack, and he pictures in his mind a fleet ballistic missile, what he calls a fleet ballistic missile. And um, the idea would be, we'll just put the missile inside a submerged submarine. And then if it ever came to it, if we were ever attacked, then the missile could be launched from a submerged submarine, and that would be the retaliatory strike. And it would survive because you can't sneak attack a submarine where you have no idea where it is. So it'd be highly survivable and would provide the, um, provide the assurance of avoiding a hair trigger type of situation where you, you got to go with it because we're not sure if we're all going to survive an attack. Well, no. Now you have a complete force that, frankly, is going to survive. So it was a good idea. Now, now Burke, um, I'm sorry, Curtis LeMay fought against it because he saw that as a direct threat against the Strategic Air Command. Uh, but even Air Force officers like uh, General Bernie Schriever who became the father of our ICBM force, recognized that there was a lot of common sense to what Admiral Burke was saying, and that was something that was needed. There were some huge technical difficulties, however, with the idea. Unlike a, an ICBM, these things were big. They, they did carry thermonuclear warheads, which weighed one and a half tons apiece, but you'd make a big muscle, missile to go with it. And these were liquid-fueled missiles, Werner von Braun from Nazi Germany, remember with the, the, uh, the VX missiles, you know, he was doing the Redstone Arsenal here in America, and they were putting these huge liquid-fueled rockets together. The Na for the Navy thing to work, Navy did not want liquid-fueled rockets on board a ship because it would destroy the ship. It could easily destroy the ship with, you know, with a, when you have a rocking platform going on. They did test with liquid-fueled missiles, and they were extremely dangerous on board a ship. So they wanted to go with a solid fuel type rockets. Solid fuel is less energetic than liquid fueled rockets. So there's a concern. Now you don't have the range anymore. So that would take, there's going to take something. And if you're going to put this thing inside a submarine, you can't have a huge Atlas missile anymore. Now you need a very small missile, uh, just a fraction of the size. But yet, for it to be effective, it would still have to reach Moscow from the ocean, which means it needs a thousand nautical mile range. So you'd have to have something that can carry a warhead a thousand nautical miles to just make the thing even sound right. So the Navy went into this and they started putting, seeing could they put together a missile. It's going to be small. But then there's one last uh, 
uh, underlying problem is the thermonuclear warhead. Again, to make, they estimated in order to make the fleet ballistic missile work inside a submarine, the warhead had to be small and it had to weigh less than 1,000 pounds in order for it to go. And in fact, there was a Nobel laureate, I was reading through the literature, there was even a Nobel laureate at the time said, that's impossible, you can't do that. And at then, Burke calls a conference at Knopska, it's near the Knopsk Lighthouse in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and they're discussing this thing. And the challenge comes up, says, it doesn't matter, Admiral, you can't make a thermonuclear weapon that will fit your missile. And then uh, the two Livermore participants at the conference, they join a committee headed by our friend David Griggs. Remember David Griggs? I brought up all the time. David's the, uh, the group leader. But anyway, Edward stands up and he looks at Admiral Burke and he says, Admiral, we can give you your missile by 1961. I'm sorry for the Hungarian accent. That's the best I can do. Um, and Burke looks, he has a distinguished physicist telling him that, yes, we can give you a thermonuclear warhead to give your idea of work. Burke says, I'll go with it, and boom, right on the spot, they offers a contract to Livermore to uh, come up with a warhead for this thing. Then he also looks at Carson Mark as the head of the Los Alamos weapons program at the time, and he also goes and he asks Carson Mark, well, can Los Alamos come up with a warhead? Mark says, it's never been done. Um, it would be a hell of a challenge, and it'll take a lot more than five years to develop this kind of warhead, to make it that small and make it all work. So then Burke says, okay, Livermore, you said you can do it, here's your contract, do it. So uh, Livermore now is going to absorb this thing, and if you read Edward's memoirs, by the way, do I have, yeah, I have a couple of minutes, he, he says, he then goes back to Livermore and he tells Harold Brown what he just promised, and Brown goes into an epileptic fit, supposedly, and run around, and what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? And Edward says he calmed everything, and I got down, and I'm, I'm sorry for, there are probably a lot of fans out there, I'm probably pissing off some people, but sorry about that, but no. Uh, if you'll recall, that's why I brought it up, the flute went off two weeks before the Knopska conference. Brown was perfectly aware he could come up with a warhead that weighed less than 1,000 pounds and could still perform as a strategic warhead. He was knew it. In fact, I have documents he wrote, even before the Knopska conference, he wrote to the Navy saying that, yes, we could meet that type of criteria. So I'm sorry, Edward's memoir is a little bit off there. Harold, in fact, I, I spoke to Johnny Foster and I said, who, who did tell Harold Brown what, what uh, Edward had promised? He said, well, I did. He said, I flew right back to Livermore. I found uh, Harold, sat with him and said, and told him what had happened. I said, and here's what Edward said, blah, blah, blah. And, and first, Harold's reaction was, he said, what? You know, which is kind of natural, right? But, but then, boom, then we went out. So now we have a contract. We now, somehow, the laboratory is going to have to convert an experiment in 1956 and make it into a warhead for a missile that doesn't exist yet, coming out of a submerged submarine, and it still has to function in outer space, come back in. And they, they've, they've taken on a contract to do that. In the meantime, the Navy does does go ahead and they produce the Polaris missile. That's the name they give to this fleet ballistic missile program. It's called Polaris. That's President Kennedy, and he's looking at the uh, launch of a Polaris missile. Kennedy was fully aware of how important this was to the strategic defense of the United States. I have several letters he wrote back to the Department of the Navy and that he, and that he gave to his National Security Council how this is incredibly important for the strategic deterrence of the United States because this is a survivable force now. It's not, this is not something you can make a sneak attack on. This is something that now provides us with a highly survivable force. And we promised by 1961 to do it. We actually had it done by 1958. Within two years, we actually had developed a warhead good enough to go inside that missile. So we beat our own deadline by a couple of years. And that picture on the top is a celebration, right? And you have Mike May is on the far right, the guy at the far right. Jim Frank is holding the pennant up on the left. There's some naval officers there. And you know, you can see these, this picture is up, uh, up in building 132. And if you're walking around, you'll see this. And if you're like me, you say, well, that's nice. I wonder what they're celebrating. This is what they're celebrating that the laboratory went out on a limb and came up 
with a warhead that was badly needed by the country, and he did it in time, because when Kennedy becomes president, he's going to be immediately tested, which is what we're going to hear about next week. He's going to be immediately tested, uh, and the defense of the United States is going to come right up to the fore. And this weapon system just comes online at a perfect time for our defense. Okay? And that's what we'll hear about next week. But this is the background to it. I'm sorry I'm, I skipped over a little bit of Draper Lab. Remember I told you these weapons had to also be accurate for the counterforce. And so there was also a lot of work went on. We were working in concert with Draper Labs and with other, uh, Lockheed made a lot of the other components. And uh, we also had to make it so the warhead would mold well with this small missile. And all of that good work with Admiral Wertheim at the SPO, uh, uh, Admiral Burke created a new naval office called Special Projects Office just to develop this thing. It was so much innovation. When Burke first suggested a fleet ballistic missile, there was no such thing as a submarine launch ballistic missile. There was no such thing as submarines launching missiles at all. There was, none of that existed. And within five years, he has the President of the United States observing a launch of that, a fully operational weapon system for the defense of the United States. It's a phenomenal achievement. And we ought to be very proud that we were part of that. Okay? And it came out just, just in time. Uh, launched in 1960, January 1960, the George Washington was the first Polaris missile to submarine to go out in, in trials, could see trials. And so now next week, Kennedy is going to be elected president, and he's going to be hit with an ultimatum from a Russian thug that's going to make the Ukrainian thing look like a piece of cake, frankly. Uh, so it's timely. We're seeing how a Russian thug can act. And even now, I'm, I'm hearing, if you turn on the news, you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, what did we do back in 1960 when we got hit with a much more serious threat to our freedom? And I'll be cool. And we here played a very essential role in that. Okay, with that now, I will open it up for questions if we have any from wherever. Yes, sir. All right, here, let me get you the mic. Uh, in the middle of your lecture, you mentioned the um, uh, Foster's uh, announcement of the, uh, the new program to develop a more efficient nuclear yes, device. Yes, called the Robin. The Robin. Uh, what's the definition of efficiency in the context of a nuclear device? Um, well, one quick and dirty one was what's called yield to weight. That is, how much yield, how much energy do you get based on how much fuel did you use? If you get more yield with less fuel, that's more efficient. No, so a quick and dirty answer is yield to weight. We have a question. What was the maximum yield limit for tests at the Nevada test site? It was 60 tons, 60 kilotons, as I recall. Uh, 50 or 60, I forget. I mean, it's 50 or 60 kilotons was the maximum. And uh, it was hellacious getting that thing started because a rumor started that the uh, Nevada test site was going to poison the water supply to the city of Los Angeles kind of thing. So they were fighting all sorts of things. But anyway, they came up with a, it had to be less, than I believe it was 60, it could be 50, but I think it was 60 kilotons. And the way, you, the way, you, uh, the way they handled that was to, to minimize the chances of uh, untoward re, uh, fallout clouds, let's say, going someplace or another. You, didn't, you did not test if the winds were from the north because the biggest urban area was Las Vegas to the south, 50 miles to the south. So the winds had to be going in the right direction. And you elevated the weapon where you either put the weapon up on a tower or you slung it from a balloon. You would suspend it from a balloon or you could drop it from an airplane and detonate it at altitude. And if you did that, there was much less fallout because a lot of the fallout would come out from um, the ground, from the dust in the ground going up, which became radioactive. So the Polaris missile was a, a, <clears throat> a great achievement and success. Um, how hard, I understand that it was Sandia Lab that took every, everything outside of the nuclear explosives package. How hard was that, their part? Uh, not trivial. The, um, some of the things Sandia did, the some Sandia teams did early on, was to enhance the performance of the warhead inside actual performance of the warhead 
by the way, uh, changing its environment. And I'm, I'm being, trying to be very careful with my words. So some of the, some of the technology Sandia worked on was to greatly improve the initial conditions that a nuclear warhead would experience as it was going off. And that, that occurred outside the physics package. And so Sandia took on that role and they came up with uh, many inventions for that. The firing sets going on, it had to meet military specifications. It had to meet the physicist specifications. I mean, the simultaneity of a charge arriving at two different points, you know, had to be to within, you know, fractions of a nanosecond. I mean, so the technological uh, challenges faced by Sandia, and finally, the, later on, the safety security systems, the PAL systems and that, were also taken over by Sandia. So these were extraordinary. I know I highlight the actual performance. You know, the thing goes off and you get a yield, but that is the result of teams of teams working on this together. And yet, Sandia was a crucial, integral part of that. And I'm sorry if I don't mention everybody all the time. Uh, I usually try to stick with one name. I'll say Johnny Foster, I'll say Harold Brown, and I'll keep it at that. But yes, for every time I mention their names, of course, there are a team of people behind them backing them up. We have two more from our virtual audience. One is curious if our cleaner designs are also followed by other countries and if offers any and if it offers any advantages or disadvantages. All right, our computer codes. Um, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to stay on safe ground with this. Um, as I related, we had a computer culture here from Johnny von Neumann that was extraordinarily strong. <clears throat> and I think I can easily argue in the late 1950s going into the 1960s, Livermore had superior code work done. That was the envy of everybody, and including Los Alamos did garner that um, there was something to be gained by collaboration. And so many of the computer codes <clears throat> that came, uh, came out of Livermore back to Los Alamos. Now I will say the earliest, very, very earliest codes, code came from Los Alamos into Livermore and Chuck Leet worked on that. You know, so the earliest codes did come out of Los Alamos, but the amount of work that went in to the codes uh, made Livermore pretty much the preferred thing. Now that was into the 60s, and then uh, eventually the good physicists at Los Alamos were beginning to figure this thing out. And, and actually by the 1980s, by the mid 80s, then you could even argue, well now did Los Alamos overtake Livermore in some codes and not, uh, hard to say, but, uh, but no, there's a sharing. But Livermore, especially in the period I'm talking about, I think I can defend that Livermore had the superior computer codes going into nuclear weapons design, which explains why, frankly, why the uh, Livermore was able to leapfrog ahead with these very revolutionary radical designs that was all based on computer coding. It was not because somebody sat back, picked the navel, and said, I think I'm going to make a small warhead. No, they had a lot of technology backing that up. And that technology, often, more often than not, was represented by a computer code. Were there any fake designs leaked to our opponents to prevent or slow copying of the technology? Were there any state designs? Fake. fake. Fake designs. That, that did what? Were there any fake designs leaked to our opponents to prevent or slow oh. copying of the technology? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think I'm going to skip a joke I used to have. <laughs> <laughs> there, were times, there were times with the x-ray laser where uh, a lot of things were being claimed that we were accomplishing. And I remember joking with a compatriot, I said, uh, we, ought to take, we ought to take this individual and, and slip him off to the Russians and, you know, and maybe they'll believe him. But uh, no, as far as to the best of my knowledge, we've never, we've never tried to deceive anybody about designs. There is an anecdote when we had a, there was an accident in Spain in which a hydrogen bomb, uh, one landed in the Mediterranean, one landed on the ground. The ground one did explode. It did, was not a nuclear explosion, but it was a high explosive explosion. And they had to clean up the plutonium that had been spread around that, that town. But the one that fell in the, in the uh, Mediterranean Sea, they had to come up with, because now you had a hydrogen bomb sitting in the bottom of the sea. And so they did come back and then they picked it up and there, there were a lot of news people, uh, there were a lot of news reels and all watching this as they're extracting the weapon out of the sea. And that was seen. And I heard an anecdote, Charles de Gaulle, I believe, was the premier of France at the time. And he looked at his nuclear staff and he looked at that and he says, how come their weapons are so small? 
like that. So, so there was sometimes, sometimes that, that kind of, uh, it wasn't espionage or anything, but p apparently it was a shock to De Gaulle that our weapons were so small. And this thing, that's why I'm trying to make a point out of the uh, Polaris, this thing was a third smaller than anything that was thought that was possible to exist. I mean, even a Nobel laureate said you can't do it. And, and so that, and when the Russians, by the way, went into a test ban at this time, I'm thinking because they, they're there and they, they were, they totally did not comprehend the United States could actually come up with an incredibly small warhead. So, but that wasn't fake, that was for real. No, yeah. Uh, speaking on the espionage, one uh, question is, were there any Soviet or foreign moles uncovered at LLNL? Hmm. No, I'm not aware. Uh, the ones I'm aware of, the big ones, Klaus Fuchs uh, and two or three others at Los Alamos during the Manhattan Project. Of course, there was the infamous case of Wen Ho Lee at Los Alamos in the 1990s. And then um, there were, I remember there were 30, 30 uh, Canadian citizens at the Metallurgical Laboratory in Chicago that were found to be Soviet spies. And the rest that I know were military people. There was the, um, the, the brothers, at the, the naval, there was a naval guy that, that sold a lot of uh, submarine secrets to the Soviets. Um, there were a couple others, but those were, those were military. And then we had the CIA person that, that sold stuff to the Israelis. But I'm not, as far as I know, I do not. Oh, the closest thing I can think of is we once had a, a head of security here, a F FBI. He was former head of FBI. And uh, he unfortunately ended up having an affair with a woman who turned out to be a Chinese uh, operator uh, with the Chinese government, communist Chinese government. This happened many years ago. Uh, as far as I know, nothing ever escaped or anything, but he did have uh, a very unwise relationship with a young woman who turned out to be associated with the communist Chinese government. That's the closest I've seen Livermore ever getting involved with espionage. Okay, last question. I said that last time. Truly last question. Once warheads were miniaturized while maintaining high yield, what prevented people from making bigger versions? Um, well, one thing that came about, and this actually came about from Livermore too, was they found, for example, you could have a much more, you could much more effectively uh, neutralize a military target if you hit it, let's say, with three medium yield weapons than one huge weapon. That if you spread it out and made smaller weapons that, that hit several points, the effects, the military effects were greater than just making a gargantuan thing. So ironically, uh, with the progress that went on in the late 60s into the 70s, uh, if, if the, these charts, you'll see that the, the total yield of the American stockpile suddenly declined. And the reason for that decline was that, that observation that uh, the, the weapons were more militarily effective if you spread them out and, and they had lower yield. So one reason why you don't necessarily have to keep making things bigger and bigger and bigger is frankly the military advantage is, doesn't, isn't there. Is, if anything, it's a military disadvantage to go to super high yields. And so the, at least within America, uh, we, never went, we never went that way. The highest yield weapon I showed you, Mike May's, Mike May's W41, that was the highest yield weapon in the stockpile of the United States, and that came out as I suggested in around 1960, you know, so that was, and that was retired decades ago, and that was the highest yield. After that, everything kind of settled down to lower yields. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. See you next. Okay.